I'm going to start by providing a foundation of shared terms and vocabulary. This is so that when I use a word like theme, you know what theme means to me. I tend to find that semantics are the source of most major misunderstandings in life. Well, that and instruction manuals for DIY furniture. After a foundation of terminology, I'll provide an overview of the hero's journey. Since most writers already have a basic understanding of the hero's journey, I'd like to show you my view of it and how my writer's perspective might be different and different from the mainstay of Jungian and mythological analysis. Then, I will retell three core goddess-based ancient myths as a foundation for understanding the heroine's journey narrative beats and themes. These are 1. Demeter, Ancient Greek 2. Isis, Ancient Egyptian 3. Inanna, Sumerian or Ishtar, Akkadian and Assyrian. With these first parts as a framework, I will then dive deep into the beats, themes, tropes, archetypes, function, and messaging of the heroine's journey. This will provide the tools you need to identify gendered themes and messages in your own work, the work of others, and the world around you. We'll then explore the critical, social, and academic disenfranchisement of the heroine's journey and contrast that to its commercial success. The vilification of the romance genre is a prime example of wide-scale abuse of the heroine's journey, as is the disregard of comedy as frivolous or the trivialization of happy endings as pat, weak, unrealistic, or cheap. We'll finish with a step-by-step -step actionable breakdown of what aspects of the heroine's journey make for a compelling narrative and how they might be applied with examples and concrete tips. In other words, how the heroine's journey can be used to manipulate reader expectations and rule the entertainment world. 1. Why did I bother? in which I make some startling confessions. So how did a fiction writer end up taking on the grave risk of writing nonfiction? Well, as stories are my wheelhouse, I'm going to start with a bit of one. However, I promise that this story is true. Picture in your head a lady with a keen interest in classical mythology and philosophy a passion for archaeology, and a side habit as a chronic fantasy author. If you want a visual, there is long brown hair in a scraggly ponytail, boot-cut jeans, and a propensity for green-ribbed bodysuits. Hey, it's the 90s. So, in case you hadn't guessed, that's me. Long story short, I graduated with honors in archaeology and minors in theology, geology, anthropology, philosophy, and classics, and several unfinished fantasy novels. Yes, big ol' nerd. I really like learning. Plus, one tends to pick up lots of minors when one is an interdisciplinary major. Still, I must confess that the last time I officially studied the heroine's journey was in school. But here's the thing. The moment I did study it, I noticed how much I was drawn to this narrative. I found something profoundly comforting and reassuring in the connections a heroine makes, in her acts of solidarity, in the hope she renders, and in the gathering of information, or, occasionally, body parts. Looking at you, Isis. I'm not one of those people who thinks in terms of revenge. I don't want to go out by myself and chop off heads. This seems messy and lonely, and it never ends well for either the chopper or the chop e. So clearly, the hero's journey was not for me. I wanted to read and write about family, found or otherwise, 
and go questing in the company of others. By all means, let's do the thing. But let's do that thing together. Learning to compromise might seem boring, but, frankly, it also seems a darn sight more sensible and mature, and certainly more applicable to my own life. So there I was, profoundly attracted to this particular narrative.